Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello, Merry Christmas and welcome to the Movie Trap. My name is Russell Carlson and with me are my festive elves, Chris Boroff. Hey Gizmo, do you want some fried chicken? <laughs> and always with me, my favorite little helper, Zach Powers. We'll talk about that theme too, because I, I I have a lot of thoughts on it. But um, mm-hmm. welcome to the movie trap. Um, normally, just to give you a rundown in case this is the first time you're hearing it, uh, the movie trap, how this works is that one of the three hosts you just met picks a theme, and then each of us pick a movie based on that theme. And then once we've watched all three movies, we then vote. And then whoever's movie wins the vote, that host gets to pick the next theme. However, because this is Christmas and because it's the holiday season, it is our annual tradition. Technically to do Boxing a, Day. Yeah, when you're releasing this, it's the day after Christmas. So you're probably either, you're probably hungover, you're probably stuffed. Mm-hmm. You're Maybe probably you're at an airport and, going home. Yeah, right, right. Um, you know, drowning Enjoying that $14 mini- water bottle you just bought. <laughs> Right, yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah, drowning in, in Santa's gifts, uh, folding away the stockings if you're really studious and putting away your decorations already. But anyway, since this is our holiday episode, we did a random draw, although despite our best efforts to <laughs> rig the vote, um, we ended up rolling with 1984's Gremlins, um, which is also funny because... Uh, we have talked about Gremlins in the past as a, a different iteration uh, yeah. in the Old Testament yeah. of the movie trap, shall we say. Maybe maybe as a Christmas treat, we could put out some audio <laughs> from our old, if we still have it. It may not exist. I think I think oh, it still it exists. exists. I still have it in the archive somewhere. But yeah, hmm. that was the last time I saw it too. Like I haven't seen, I haven't updated my opinion on this film since then, but I've heard about it being possibly remade in between. Oh god! Yet. I've heard. Of, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up too. Uh, luckily, we'll talk about. We could talk about the potential for remakes and and when and where because that's been a conversation for many many years. So yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, uh, just a heads up, listener. Uh, this is being recorded on a day where I just went out with my girlfriend's family. We watched It's a Wonderful Life in the theater. I had a bunch of cocktails, so I'm going to be a little freewheeling <laughs> for. <laughs> Yeah, Zach's episodes. gonna be remarkably close to Dick Miller in this film, possibly. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Ah! <laughs> Poor Mr. Futterman. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I guess Zach, uh, since you're already telling us that you're driving drunk, let's go ahead and get through the plot synopsis of Gremlins. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Gremlins is a 1984 uh, comedy Christmas horror film. Horror. Uh, directed by Joe Dante. It was written by Chris Columbus, who you may know from Home Alone and the first couple Harry Potter movies. Uh, not the genocidal one. The the guy who makes kind of mediocre movies mostly, but a couple are good. Um, it stars uh, Zach Galligan, Phoebe Cates, and Howie Mandel as the voice of Gizmo the Mogwai. Um uh, it tells the story of uh, of a family in, uh, I guess it's probably Upper New York. It's a parallel for, uh, it, I can't remember, what, what is it called? It's called something. It's called Kingston Falls is right. the name so of it's it. So yeah. it's a play on Bedford Falls. Uh, it looks very similar to the town from Back to the Future because it's the same set. It is the same town, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, inventor Randy Peltzer, uh, is in Chinatown in New York City uh, just before the Christmas holidays looking for the perfect gift for his son, Billy, when he comes across uh, a, a, a Chinese sort of antique shop uh, underneath the street level, kind of out of the way, and discovers a strange creature that is heretofore unknown by mankind. Um <laughs> You know, like you do, you just casually go into a shop and find some creepy gremlin that's just never existed before and you've never heard of it before. Well, I would not describe Gizmo as creepy, but... And and then being very, very aggressive in purchasing it, too. I gotta Mm -hmm. have it. Look, I'll give you $200 right there. Cash money. Yeah. Is this an invasive species? I want it as fast as possible. 
right, it is indeed yeah. <laughs> indeed deeply invasive. <laughs> uh, we'll get into the the dynamics of how the Mogwai work later. But um, uh, the shopkeeper is like, no, 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 no. You cannot have this. It's extremely dangerous. You don't have the discipline. You can't have it. Uh, but the shopkeeper's grandson, uh, a young boy who loves the Yankees and money, um, is like, yeah, I'll give it to you for 200 bucks behind my grandfather's back and sells off Gizmo the Mogwai to Randy, who takes it home to Kingston Falls. Uh, in Kingston Falls, his son Billy works as a teller at a local bank. Um, he is uh, perhaps not where he should be in life, it's implied. A lot of his friends, like Judge Reinhold, are uh, like vice presidents at the bank and, and making a lot more money while he's still living at home and being friends with young children like Corey Feldman. Um, yeah, that's uh, an odd... Bringing his uh, there's a lot. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about. We'll, we'll get into it. Sorry, in keep going. Keep going. He's bringing his dog to work, uh, for better or worse, um, and the town seems to be sort of at the the beck and call of Mrs. Deagle. I mean, Mr. Elder... Potter. I mean, Mrs. Deagle. Excuse me. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, Mrs. Deagle, uh, a wealthy old widow, who um, who's whatever she says seems to go in Kingston Falls. Uh, she hates Billy and his dog. She threatens to kill the dog, in fact, and get Billy and fired. And his little dog, too. Yeah, exactly. She's very much got... I think the Wicked Witch of the West music actually plays over Mrs. Deagle at a certain point. Sort of. The Gremlins theme itself sort of sounds like the Wicked Witch theme. A little bit. Um, regardless, uh, uh, he also has a crush on Phoebe Cates, Uh um, who is, Kate is the name of the character in this movie, um, who is not as impressed by Judge's Reinhold, Judge Reinhold's money and seems to also have a bit of a crush on Billy. Um, anyway, he returns home from work one day to receive Gizmo as a gift, uh, a little mogwai who comes with a certain set of rules. Um, the rules being he doesn't like bright light and direct sunlight is in fact fatal to him. So don't expose him to direct sunlight. Water is a no-go. Never never uh, have water in his presence or never get him wet. And of course, most importantly, never ever feed him after midnight. I guess... In, <laughs> that was ominous. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in terms of, I guess, wherever, whatever time zone you're in, right. that's what's determined. <laughs> Obviously, the rules are a little wonky. Um, yeah. Yeah, the only pet out there that doesn't need water, that you specifically can never give its little desiccated body water. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, everything is going great. Gizmo's an extremely friendly little guy. Uh, he's cute as all get out. Um, he introduces Gizmo to uh, Corey Feldman and all that. And it's, it's going great until one night, uh, Corey Feldman accidentally spills water on Gizmo and five other little mogwais pop out. Um, asexually reproducing just creates five more of these things. And at that point, they're like, this undiscovered creature that seems to have the ability to speak English might be weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they take it into their local high school biology teacher. They take one of the five uh, in uh, to, to get a better idea of, of, of what its deal is. Um, meanwhile, uh, the other Mogwai seem to be, besides Gizmo, seem to be a little mean. They wrap up the dog in Christmas lights. They're nasty and cruel to Gizmo all the time. Something is a little off about the non-Gizmo Mogwai. And one night they chew through the cord on his alarm clock to trick Billy into feeding them after midnight. Gizmo does not partake. And the next night, day, he wakes up to find five little gross green cocoons. They look like the eggs from Alien, basically, uh, in his room. Um, so now they have this new species, and eventually, uh, a, a day or so later, these things begin to hatch um and they immediately begin torturing gizmo uh and eventually make their way downstairs um 
not before the one that the uh, biology teacher took manages to kill the biology teacher. Uh, uh, he, you know, pulls him under the desk, stabs him in the ass with the same little uh, syringe that he used to draw his blood. Uh, it seems like they're bad news. The other Mogwai begin to torture Billy's mother. Uh, she manages to kill all but one of them. Uh, Billy, and now aware that his biology Badass teacher... Billy's mom is. Yeah, she she really fights mm -hmm. them off. <laughs> she handled um, it like, like nothing. <laughs> Yeah, some of the more disturbing sequences I can remember from my childhood. Billy has figured out what the hell is going on. Sure. His bio biology teacher is dead, so he runs home to try and protect his mom um, and saves her from the final gremlin just in time by cutting off its head with a sword. Uh, meanwhile, his father is off at an adventures convention, which is just full of weird shit. Um, uh but the final, uh, the final gremlin, Stripe, the leader of the offspring of Gizmo, who has a little mohawk, uh, manages to escape. And he runs to the local YMCA, where he jumps in the pool and multiplies himself thousands of times. So now there's hundreds, if not thousands, of these creatures running around Kingston Falls. The police do not believe Billy when he goes to see them. Um, but pretty soon the, the calls start coming in and it seems like there's pure chaos going on in the town. Uh, they're changing stoplights. They're murdering people dressed as Santa. They're trying to break into Corey Feldman's room. They're killing Rocky Ricky Rialto on the radio. Um, they are massacring this town, uh, and have taken over the bar as well, where Phoebe Cates works. They all have little mugs of beer and little cigarettes and little trench coats and they're playing cards with little cards and playing jazz uh, tunes yep one mm -hmm. of them has a tiny gun uh and uh she manages to figure out that the bright lights scare them and using a camera uh escapes from the bar infested with gremlins meanwhile um billy makes his way downtown and meets up with her as well and they take uh, refuge in the bank as the entire town descends into chaos. Uh, at this point, uh, Phoebe Cates, uh, uh, who has been sort of negative on Christmas so far, reveals that she had a traumatic Christmas memory where her father died trying to be Santa coming down the chimney at one point. Um, and that's why she hates Christmas so much. Uh, but at the same time, they don't have a lot of time to, to dissect this news because all of the gremlins have gathered at the local movie theater to watch Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which they seem to love. Um, Billy and Kate managed to go under the stage and open the gas in the movie theater and set a, a flame, sort of a, a light of cloth on fire so that eventually the entire theater will explode, which indeed it does killing a, a fair share of the gremlins, but not Stripe who was off at the local convenience store getting candy. Um, and now they have to stop Stripe before he can reproduce once again, after a chase sequence through the convenience store involving uh, RC cars and chainsaws and all this stuff. Uh, Stripe has a gun and is about to jump into a water fountain when at the last minute, Gizmo manages to open the skylight, exposing Stripe to direct sunlight and melting him horribly um, uh, and killing him outright before he can, can reproduce yet again. In the conclusion of the movie, back home again, uh, the old uh, Chinese man comes a knocking at the Peltzer's door and says, you guys are not ready for the responsibility of the Mogwai. Billy, maybe one day you'll be ready because Gizmo seems to love you quite a lot. Um, and uh, he, he leaves with uh, Gizmo as uh, Randy Peltzer gives us the concluding monologue of the film. And that is basically the story of Gremlins. Pretty straightforward. Not a whole yeah. lot of zigs and zags. Pretty, yeah. yep. Nope. Nope. It's it sort of, it, it's a movie that, that tries to do a lot at once. 
by playing and it was common in this era too because i mean it was released in in july to to counter ghostbusters so horror comedy is kind of the theme of the summer it seems like for the blockbusters um and they they very much lean into that i mean it starts out kind of scary and dark but it as the gremlins uh keep rolling through town it eventually steers very sharply into self-parody um and and sort of just yeah. hits the brakes on it before it gets too too far, and then they make the sequel, and then just go right into the self parody. The sequel yeah. is far we'll far get into far the sequel later, here. but yeah, um, it's super strange it's, though. Like, what is the theme? Like, what is like for me? I've always wondered what the genre of this one is because I know it's people say horror comedy, but the tone is so strange. Like, you'll have scenes in it that are really serious, like when she's talking about her dead dad. And then you'll have scenes yeah. where it's like the flash dance gremlin and it's just like spinning around on the floor. And it's yeah. like, it, it's both of those scenes exist in the same movie. It just really takes you on a roller coaster in odd moments. Yep. Yeah. Very strange. And it, it's funny. It's funny, Borf, that you bring up the, the Phoebe Kate story. Cause that's the, the one distinct memory I have of our discussion back in the film concussion days of it. And that's one of your favorite parts is the Phoebe Kate story because it's really dark and but kind of funny uh especially her her the the end point where she says that's how i find out there was no santa you know i i get <laughs> why that's one of your favorite parts uh but it does kind of just stop the movie just kind of like yeah. puts the movies in high breaks and we're just gonna stop the movie right here and have this little like kind of moment um that doesn't really inform anything about anything other than just that christmas can be shitty yeah, I don't know. And it's hard to say if that was meant to be a show. Like, I, I could see a world where Dante was like, this is a dark, funny joke. Like, we're going to stop <laughs> the movie for this horrible, horrible story in the middle of this fucking wild third act where there's so much going on. And that's right. the joke. And I, I, I right. think that there's, and, a, there's an argument to be made that that is what the case is. But there's also an argument to be made that it's very much meant to be played straight. Well, it's weird well, because and it's, in the it's, sequel, they, they straight up spoof it. They do. Yeah. 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 It's straight weird. Up. I mean, they, they spoof a lot. They even bring up the whole time zone thing uh, in the sequel, too. Again, it, 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 it oh, revolves around wild, self-parody yeah. and the, right, the sequel. But, but with this one, I think that part of the, 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 you know, with that scene in particular, apparently, like, it was a pretty big fight between Dante and Warner Brothers. And even Spielberg was kind of taking Warner Brothers' side on not including this scene but dante kind of dug in his heels and really wanted it and i very much wonder why um i i it doesn't do anything for the whole movie it like i said it's not even related to billy it's related to billy's crush and it's her past and it's not really like i said it's it's yeah. and they confusing. definitely cut like there's that sequence in the bank where they're like sort of uh regrouping before the third act um, had another deleted sequence. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It was filmed, but there is a scene where Judge Reinhold, who is in the first part of this movie as a sort of rival to Billy, a very successful rival, um, is also in the bank. He has locked himself in the vault and has like basically completely lost his mind and is like completely riven with fear, cowering in the vault. And there was a scene where they talk to him for a little bit that was cut from the final print of the movie. That's interesting because it makes you, I, I, you as I'm watch, as I'm remembering watching it, like you see the scene with Billy and Phoebe Cates and judge Reinhold in the bar. And that's the last you see of judge Reinhold. Yeah, he's, that's it. He's, that, yeah. That's it. You don't see any, it, you can find on YouTube. You see the fate of every other character in this town. You see Mrs. You Deagle see, die. You know, yeah. yeah. You get it, the Futterman, the, the, the drunken guy who hates foreigners. Um, Futterman it, dies, but he actually comes back in the next movie, so he, he yeah, for some presumably yeah. survived. Yeah. It seems like they just sort of gave up on that story thread and just said, people forget about it by the end. We've got all those other scenes happening. I actually had forgotten about his character by the end, so you brought it up. Sure. And yeah, that's definitely a plot hole that I just ignored. Um, I don't know. It might be just that the scene had a function to have an excuse for Billy and Kate to get closer to have kind of a quiet moment between the two of them so they could be closer as characters. Sure. But, you know, they're also getting chased around by monsters. Well, I, I don't know. know. I, 
I think that the thing about Gremlins, and it's something that I actually, a lot of people prefer Gremlins 2, which is more of an overt comedy. It's more meta. Like they have Siskel and Ebert in the movie Leonard talking Malton. about how bad Gremlins Malton. 1 is. I, oh, Leonard Malton. I, I actually watched Gremlins 2 to, in preparation for it just because it was already on. Yeah, and they I, have I literally it, like, so they it. mock the people who gave bad reviews to Gremlin, Gremlins 1 right. and give them cameos in the movie. Yep, um, yep. Which Hulk is Hogan you know, shows up. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. It's very meta. It's very they have a weird Donald Trump stand in who is yeah. not as a lot malevolent. More <laughs> yeah. right. I, I um, actually have not seen that one either. Like I haven't seen Gremlins Two in probably close to twenty. Gremlins years. Two is a wild been, fucking movie. I have a vague memory of the Hulk Hogan thing and an electric gremlin, and that's kinda it. There's a key and peel sketch. Um about the pitch meeting for Gremlins 2. Um, I think where I might have seen that. They have this guy. Yeah. This guy who comes in and it's like, he asks everybody at the table for their wildest idea. And he's wild about every single one. And he's like, it's in the movie. It's in the movie. Uh, it's a very funny sketch. I, I recommend looking it up. And when you see, like Gremlins 1 is a wild fucking movie already. So, you know, yeah. but I, yeah, I actually, it's, it's it's kind of a lot of things going on at once, as I said, you know, like it's it's first of all, it's Christmas in the 80s. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so and it's also Spielberg sort of in the, the beginning stages at the height of his powers, um, where we're kind of we kind of talked about this in a league of their own, where we're kind of in the 80s. We had like this nostalgia humping going on. And that's very much what I mean, you know, like they they're 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 flagrantly yeah. ripping off it's a wonderful life like setting you up to think this is like a wonderful life sort of story but then we'll just throw in some crazy scary goofy monsters and and turn it into something else entirely which is fine i mean i'm not i'm not knocking that i think that that's fine i think the problem is when you're trying to make it you know kind of spooky or just kind of goofy and it this movie kind of kind of d dance dances around both and just sort of stumbles into both uh, really. yeah i don't know i i think that this movie so I'll say a couple quick things about uh, about it. One, I know a lot of people who saw this movie when they were very young and were like, this movie scared the shit out of me when I was a little sure. kid. Um, I'm not one of those, but I do know a lot of people who said that. This movie, along with The Temple of Doom, this was the this was actually why we discussed it many years ago, right. created the PG-13 rating. We, we paired right. those two movies together way back when as the, the movies that created PG-13. Um, and three, the weird tonal, like all over the placeness of this movie works so well for me here and maybe nowhere, maybe no other movie has ever done it this well. Like the fact that I don't know what this movie is works so well for me. I love this movie. I've watched it a number of times since I know you guys haven't, but I've watched it many times since we recorded that thing 10 years ago. I watch it probably more Christmases than I don't. Uh, our kitten is named after Gizmo mm -hmm. in part. And also after the assistant from what we do in the shadows. But yeah, I don't know. For some reason, the fact that this movie is everything all the time works really well for me here. Like it, it, it doesn't need to be. It feels like it's a workable pastiche is yeah. kind of the thing. Like this one, well it, during the 80s, they had other ones that weren't that great. Like um, uh, the Twilight Zone movie, which <laughs> just couldn't get, I mean, you know why. But I mean, outside of the obvious crimes that were committed on that film, um, <laughs> it seemed that uh, they just couldn't get the tone right. Like there was something about the rhythm of it that never worked. And for some reason in Gremlins, it just works fine. Like it hits the notes, it constantly changes it up, it makes you confused, you'll be introduced to something strange and it never stops you long enough to question. Like, for example, why was she serving beer to the gremlins? It, it, how did right, that right. scene start? Right. It, just, like, it doesn't matter like how it she starts. she was surviving just fine. Yeah. You know, just keep She was just like, it was booze. just a rowdy night, just another Friday night at the yeah. bar, fine. But uh, yeah, so it was really strange that you have that scene followed immediately by the really sad scene where she's talking about her dad's death. And then in the same movie, you have like a gremlin melting in the sunlight and it's or, pretty gross, but it's still or, okay for a kid's film. Yeah. Or the scene, you know, the very, the very dramatic monologue about losing her father at Christmas, the crazy bar scene where the gremlins are absolutely 
fucking doing flash dance and flashing each other and playing poker. <laughs> and one of them has a puppet that's like, like, but then also in the same movie, there's this sequence where uh, Billy's mom is genuinely terrorized by these things. Like it's a proper horror that, sequence. That yeah, part where these things are like kid, trying to murder her me. viciously. I, I, right. I that part scared me as I can't listen to "Do You See What I See" without thinking of this scene. That this song is yeah. forever married to this scene, uh, and it scared me. I mean, that's I, 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 you know, even though like I. I saw when i was little i saw gremlins 2 first gremlins 2 was actually the first movie i ever saw in a legitimate theater um even though i wasn't al- I, was, I shouldn't have been allowed to go but i managed to get in it was like opening weekend and they weren't they weren't as uh, this is pre columbine days where they really really were were stringent about it um so i, I had no idea i just knew i don't Gizmo think anybody can ever accuse gremlins 2 of influencing violence <laughs> I, well, but the the scene, the, both both movies have a very similar scene, and there one person jams a gremlin into something that is mincing. So mm-hmm. in this movie, it's a blender, and then in the sequel, it's a paper shredder. Um, and I remember being very struck with like the green blood and how like gross and but like cool it was. I thought like, wow, this is really like violent. Without you know, I I, I like looked around and, like, should I be watching this? Am I in trouble? for like watching this because it, uh, it seems like it should be violent the blender is immediately followed up by the one that gets shoved in the microwave too microwave yeah. right yeah like i said yeah. mom was a badass <laughs> dispatch those griblets pretty yeah. handily it's kind of funny because it's one of those movies where there's like little scenes that like i think scarred all of us as children like um that was one the mom and also at the end where they're fighting the gremlin at the end and he's got the little arrow and he's shooting at billy who's been like the Stripes. hero this whole time no joke he's yeah. It's legitimately kind of a scary he's sequence. He's got a chainsaw, like, like he's got a gun yeah. at a certain point. I, I wouldn't recognize that fear again until years later dealing with a meth head. It was very strange. It's a very different, <laughs> it's a very unexpected and energy. I'll, I'll give another another sequence that's very good, a pretty good horror sequence is when the biology teacher dies and they have mm. the film of the different hearts in the background. So you have mm-hmm. the very fast hummingbird heart, like thump, 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 thump as the background noise and then it turns to the flicker of the of the uh of the Bunny. tape as it yeah. runs out yeah mm-hmm. like and then he gets pulled under the desk like that's an effective horror sequence I, I another sequence that i thought was very well effective and, and added to the sort of ominous one of the many tones that this movie has one of the sort of ominous dreadful tones is when strike jumps into the uh to the, to the swimming pool and mm-hmm. there's like this weird almost like dying cat noise that's just overlaid and overlaid and the whole pool is like bubbling like a hot tub and, and you know you're like oh this is not good um you well, know so. it's like a 1950s horror film it's yeah. kind of what those little scenes play out like it's weird because they well, just happen and they, it's you know like the blob or like the you know the thing the, the old the thing they're they're watching a movie gizmo and billy are watching a movie after he feeds them after midnight i i i, I can't remember i think it's a capra film but i don't know but i do know that the film with the hummingbird that the educational film that is in fact a capra film apparently um <laughs> if you can't tell steven spielberg and joe dante are really big fans of frank capra uh, i had no idea but yeah no i uh yeah right wouldn't have noticed um but i think that there's a lot of memorable sequences in this movie. And I think this is why this movie sort of still has a legacy. I mean, it, it came out against Ghostbusters. It did pretty well against Ghostbusters, all things being equal. You know, like it, Ghostbusters kind of was the big shit, but still Gremlins, it is still, you know, longevity. And I think had they released this at Christmas rather than the summer to try to compete sure, with yeah. Christmas, it probably would have done a little bit better because it's better as a Christmas movie. That was a part of the sequel that didn't work. They just completely removed that element. And they do the typical 80s thing and early 90s thing of any sequel. You know what? Throw them in New York. There we go. That's <laughs> that would throw them in New York City. That's the yeah. joke, you know, and it happens so many goddamn times. And yeah, it's it's sort of you could see where something like Gremlins which has this sort of myriad of tones and genres uh, falling flat on its face. I mean, really falling flat on its face. I mean, yeah, and this yeah. this movie does a good job, and I think part of the power of it is that it leans into its corniness. You know, like it it doesn't try to dodge that punt. It, it leans right into it, and I think, I think it's part of its charm. This is the... Yeah. I think Gremlins is definitely emblematic of uh, this sort of 
we talked about like some of this period in the 90s last time or a couple episodes ago during a league of their own of like movie-ish movies i think the revolution of the 80s was like really like the you got your chocolate and my peanut butterness of movies like this and maybe aliens and ghostbusters and mm-hmm. stuff like that were like uh you know genre films became more serious horror or comedy or um whatever movies wall or all at the same time. Like, I think that was, I think that's the thing people really admire about the eighties. And there was a lot of like pioneering in the genre formats in a way that was like, uh, interesting. I will say that I, I like this movie more than ghostbusters. Maybe that's sacrilege. I think ghostbusters Mm -hmm. is fine. I think gremlins is a lot of fun. Well, I, I think that kind of what you're talking about is the rise of Spielberg. Like, he started doing yep, those blockbuster yeah. tentpole movies, and it just all locked in. Like, suddenly people realized genre was a safe thing because it was an okay... It was okay for kids to be into science fiction and horror, and they could make yeah. something... I guess Star and if they Wars, did it like this, you know. Yeah. Well, like this and Ghostbusters, you managed mm-hmm. to catch that, that entire cross-section of the demographic, basically, because you caught, you know... Mm-hmm. Uh, Yupper yuppies having kids uh you caught like the 1950s boomers yeah. and you know it was a it was a weird time this one and um this one also like i don't know if you guys had ever heard of this but it also got adapted into comic books and a few other things that they used oh, to what? do at the time but here's the got thing DC, the, right I can't remember it, but the comic book based off this, I had it when I was a child and I remember it was a lot darker than this film. Like for some reason in the film, they have a lot of reserve when they do stuff and it kind of helps that tone. So you see stuff and you're like, Oh, it's happening off screen. I remember in the comic book, um, when the guy puts mail into the mailbox in the comic Mm -hmm. book, it's a really violent scene because in the movie they show him getting pulled and you don't really see what happens but in the comic book they cut to a reverse angle where it's full on man's feet getting yanked into the uh mail slot and it looks like every bone is breaking along the way so it's a little disturbing wow. and i remember that well, from when i was a seem- kid going that's way way bloodier it does seem like when you when you read into the 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 conceptual phases of this movie that it was originally supposed to be a lot darker i mean it was spielberg's idea to make a good mogwai named gizmo and this is why he's a genius because you could market the hell out of that little guy um i had one i had a little stuffed gizmo i love gizmo (laughs) that brought me to the dance because i wanted a little mogwai and i promise Mm -hmm. i would not get it wet i would not you know i would i would be a good 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 mogwai owner i promise um but that was a stroke of genius by by Spielberg by having an adorable little sidekick basically and he's not really a sidekick isn't he he's Batman he's the hero Billy's yeah. fucking Robin you know B- Billy's the one who's the little sidekick um speaking of Billy do you guys think that like Billy is too old for this character cuz like yes. when you when I'm trying yeah. to watch this movie at the beginning and and um Randall Par- Randall Peltzer says I want to get Gizmo for my kid you sort of think little boy Corey Feldman, right? You you sort of think of that, and then it's just like he's almost a grown man, you know. Like it it it. I don't know. I sort of think, and I think part of that reason is because they knew this movie was going to be pretty dark and and kind of violent and gory, and maybe to not have a little kid go through that. Whereas you look at people like Stephen King, he doesn't give a shit. He let a little kid go through all that stuff. He doesn't care. This would be a mild adventure for a Stephen King protagonist. Yeah, no kidding. Right. <laughs> well, it'd this, be more uh... like Cat's Eye for Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Um, but yeah, I would say yes, he is too old. But it's also since it's based off It's a Wonderful Life, for some reason, him being somewhere in his mid 30s to almost 40s, right. I'm guessing, it's more acceptable because you're like, oh, I remember that. I, If anything, watching it now, I was more uncomfortable about the age difference think, between him and Phoebe Cates. I think you're vastly overestimating how old this guy is. <laughs> uh, he's definitely like in his. 20s and i would guess early 20s sure yeah, but he, he's, he's like... older yeah 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 i i i, I and and yeah i i was i you know it, it just seemed odd that it seemed like this character was sort of meant to be a younger character in one movie but then in another movie in the it's a wonderful live christmas movie he's supposed to be you know jimmy stewart so yeah sure. it, well i it, think like i said this movie 
I think I think I could tell uh, you where this one breaks the rules and it's a wonderful life got it okay. Go ahead and say well, his well, age well, real quick. Uh yes, so uh Zach Galligan, uh, at the time this movie was released in 1984, was 20 years old. Phoebe Cates was 21. Oh, well, okay. I, I stand very corrected. Um, I'm going to say that I think the breakdown of this is that in It's a Wonderful Life, the lady he was talking to is roughly his same age, like as far as characters later. I think in this one, it gets weird because they have a child character who interacts with him at one point. And it's so obvious that their ages are so far apart that the fact that he casually invites this child up to his room, like, it didn't mean anything at the time, but it's very uncomfortable to see that sequence now. It In seems the attic, strange. Yeah. Yes. Uh, definitely not what they were talking about at the time. Wouldn't have probably been part of the conversation, but seeing it now, uh, it, odd. It's weird. Strange. They, I feel like... Maybe they wanted this guy to be probably about the age the actor was with arrested, like this case of arrested development, but it's like not really explored in any detail. And it doesn't seem to be a problem for the character that he's like, you know, I mean, frankly, I think a guy who's 20 working at a teller job at a bank is like, that's fine. That's a normal living yeah. at home and working at a teller job at a bank at 20 is like not that crazy. Seems normal. Well, no, that's, but it's that's, weird. He's that's hanging out with Corey Feldman. That struck me as odd. <laughs> it is, yeah. Well, but I but do think they the wanted him to seem like a Arrested Development. Judge sure. Reinhold is where he's supposed to be, and he's right. <laughs> My name is Judge. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> in Arrested Development yes. reference, but um, yes, I think that you, you get a point, where, Carlson, where kind of against my better right at the beginning when he buys Gizmo. <laughs> you know, we have no points. Wait, no there points are no on points. Oh, that's right. They, okay, all, right. There are no points on. We all we all got <laughs> okay. points. There's no points. We're not voting. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I I don't know. It just kind of struck me as odd. But I mean, I will say for the cast of this movie, I I think it's kind of brave. Spielberg's the one who kind of chose this guy. It's more or less his first movie. Phoebe Cates was kind of well known, same thing with Judge Reinhold. Um, but the his dad apparently. I don't know. Have you guys looked into that guy? He was like a uh like a folk songwriter in like the 60s and stuff and Joan Baez and the Kingston trio have done his songs he's mm. he's apparently wrote uh joy to the world for for three dog night oh, wow. uh and and wrote a song for like Ringo Starr and shit uh, well, and he oh. kind of has that voice doesn't he of kind of like an old folk country kind of he sounds like Baloo from the jungle book you know where he's just like howdy you know he's got that folksy sound uh, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was looking into that apparently famous singer songwriter I had no idea. He sounded well, familiar, but I didn't know from where. I, I don't know. You, uh, he apparently he got the job because of he played the dad in Black Beauty in '79, hmm. um, and that's where I think he did of, a lot of. I think he did a lot of voice work later. Like I think he did a lot of well, commercials. Well, he he did a lot of TV work. You know, like he was a television actor, and most of the okay. you know a lot of the side characters. Even I think the mom was actually Leah Thompson's mom in in Back to the Future. Um, but I think that most one of the things that I had to I remember when I was like in middle school or something and we were somebody was brought up uh, Gremlins and they said that Howie Mandel played the voice of Gizmo. And I did not believe him. I was like, this is mm -hmm. bullshit. Not that guy. No way. And I look it up. And sh I mean, this is middle school. So Internet wasn't that prevalent at the time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I looked and for sure as shit. Howie Mandel played the voice of Gizmo. A lot of like uh, Jim Cummings is in it. Michael Winslow, like a lot of prominent voice actors of that era. You know, I just didn't yeah, think sure. Howie Mandel was one of them. Who knew? Well, I do now, yeah. but I didn't. Then. I don't know if I don't know if he returned for the sequel or not. Like I he think did. I vaguely remembered that trivia, but yeah. Oh no, he did. He and he definitely got more top billing in the sequel for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Yeah, the, I don't know. Um, it's 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 it, the the fact that the movie leans into its B moviness. Like mm -hmm. it very much is aware that it is a B it movie is, yeah. and trying to be a B movie. But I mean, those gremlins weren't cheap. Like those gremlins were expensive because they were pretty breakthrough puppetry and animatronics and stuff. I mean, we talked a little bit about that with Howard the Duck, um, but how this kind of robotic technology is sort of burgeoning in the eighties. And, you know, Gizmo is many different variations of puppets. And you could see how, it, an adept eye can see how the camera tricks sort of work. Like specifically, there's mm -hmm. a scene where Gizmo falls into the garbage and he's sticking his little legs out, and the camera dollies into Billy, 
Billy reaches down off camera and then pulls out a fully formed gizmo. Two different puppets, you know. And so it's just fun sure. camera tricks like that 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 make this movie. I think, and this is where I think, and I, I, they're gonna do another one. We just know this. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're going to do it eventually. They're gonna make yeah. it CGI. They've been they're gonna make it CGI. this TV series for a while. I honestly I don't know pass. what. I don't know what they would be able to add to it. Like, they would have to, I think, tell an entirely new story because the tone of this movie, I think, is what makes this movie... Very difficult to replicate. Yeah. So it's like but it's I... like Ghostbusters. It's a specific tone that one movie hit, and no matter how mm-hmm. many times you go back, you're not going to do it the same way. So it's not going to yeah. play out the same way. And I said, got a very strange vibe. It's like the movie Mandy. Like, it's got a vibe to it that you got to just kind of be into what that movie's doing to accept it while you're watching it somebody else like doing it as a sequel or something like that just wouldn't have the same feeling well yeah. i mean i don't even care if they bring back dante and spielberg it's still i mean because they did it with gremlins 2 and it, it it wasn't that good you know it's it's a lot more of people of do self parody pref- a lot of people do prefer uh that one to the first one i, sure. I as i mentioned director not joe dante them. is one of them Director Joe Dante is one of them. He prefers the sequel more than this one, apparently. Uh, I I prefer this one. Um, I think I do. Yeah. Too. I don't know, but but I do too. Regardless, I will say this about the potential remake: they they're doing this anim. They've been have this animated series has been announced and it's been supposed to air for a long time. I guess it's going to come out in twenty twenty two. Secrets of the Mogwai, it's called. But I, I don't know anything about that beyond the fact that it's. I- been a long time coming and i know it's complete and they're just waiting to release it on disney plus or whatever platform oh, owns boy. gremlins now it's probably hbo sony yeah. and warner brothers maybe. but I, I will say this if they make a gremlins 3 um i actually will say i think it's better if they did it now than if they did it 10 years ago when we last discussed this film for one simple reason I think 10 years ago, the chances that it would be all CGI gremlins is much, 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 much higher. And I think now they would probably bring in genuine puppets. Like things like that are back in fashion a little more than they were 10 years ago. Thank you, baby Yoda. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I, I'm inclined. I'm inclined to agree with you. I just, I, I don't know. I, for one thing, if they do just bring, if they bring it back to its roots of this movie, of you know Christmas and kind of being dark, you know, and and sort of metatextual with the with the humor. Uh, it could work. I just it it's a it hard... would only work in the same way that I think that, man, like, that I haven't seen it, but like how I get it's how a I tough recipe. How man. the new Ghostbusters movie? Yeah, yeah. like I it, I, it I think this how... is a harder stew to make than even Ghostbusters. Right, but even that Ghostbusters stew, you in order for that stew to be flavorful, you just jam it with just nostalgia. Just don't you remember how much you loved the first movie, you know? Yeah. And I think that this would be ill served because they sort of did it with Gremlins too, and it didn't work. Um, I I would pass. I would I would pass. Plus, you know, you've already got Baby Yoda eating Gizmo's lunch. You know, like this is what what are you gonna do? Like this is you know, sorry, yeah. Disney yeah. beat you to it, Warner Brothers. You lost. <laughs> Disney will put out a new cute thing every two years anyway. Fucking Baby Yoda before him was the Porgs. Uh, whatever. Yeah. There's, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't BDA. know if there's... And next year there'll be a new cute little fucking thing they can sell a billion. So little there... Baby Groot, right? They got fucking Baby Groot. Yeah. And also yeah. that's the other thing. Like, so in the 80s, like there were these weird genre films like this that were like new and different and the tone is all over the place. And it's like, what exactly is this? Uh, now, now genre movies are the MCU. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we got like, it's the same <laughs> shit. Basically every time we got the prepackaged <laughs> meal, you buy it like a fucking lunchable. It's not like a yep. weird meal. You get at a deli that's locally owned. It's I'm... mass produced and it's oh, the same shit. The, I mean, the here's the are, thing are wholly predictable for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, they've tried to do things like this. Like, there's a director working right now. I can't remember his name. I think it's Mike Doherty, I think. Um, he did uh, uh, Trick or Treat. Uh, he also did the movie I like Krampus. Trick or Treat a lot. The yeah, Trick yeah. or Treat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and Krampus, which was mm-hmm. the other one. But the thing is, also is fun. that like trick trick or treat uh, hooked. It's become kind of a classic, like a cult classic for people. Uh, Krampus kind of passed on by a lot of people. They don't. They're yeah. not as aware of that one. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, like, are they able to do? Uh, anything like this theme wise because we've had mcu and things like that i don't know if there's enough room to do anything else it would be tough i mean i think that you know part i i think it, you know the thing the problem is spielberg you know i i think that the problem is spielberg and spielberg's going to be protective of this property and so is joe dante so i think that they're going to keep it within their house i think i would much rather see gremlins taken over by a new sort of horror director I agree. And, and kind of give a new edge to it. Cause that part of, part of what made Gremlin so kind of funny, especially for kids was that it was like, it was a bit naughty, you know, you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm watching kind of a grown up movie, you know, like it's, it's kind of a, so I, you kind of have to have that feel to it, you know? And I, I, I kind of, this generation is going to need a little bit more of a, you know, a little bit more umph than I think than than the '80s kids and than we were. You know, your lead in when you said when you said this generation, it sounded like you were going to be like with their trigger warnings. Yeah, right. <laughs> their they're, safe they're spaces, race theory. In uh, my day, well. gremlins don't have safe spaces. Right. Oh Jesus! Right. Yeah, that, well, that was we, a we, side we moment. We can do a lot more in today's age. Yeah. No, I mean, the old man in this complaining about foreign cars having gremlins in them. That was oh, one of absolutely. my memories. Oh, wouldn't he be great nowadays? You'd just put a MAGA flag in front of his house. You I know, mean, it'd be, it, you know, it'd be great. He reminded me of neighbors I had I'm in giving Indiana. him a pass for one reason. He hates the Germans and he hates the Italians and he served in World War II. You earned it. You can hate the Germans if you served in World War II. Go, go nuts. <laughs> Whatever conspiracy they get, it's in our watches, Zach. They put gremlins in our watches. Oh, they, man. They, um, yeah, yeah, that would be a... Also, but, real quick, yeah, uh, no, Dick I, Miller and his wife in the movie were all alums of George Corman films. Uh, I think Zach and I talked about this before we were actually Roger recorded. Corman? Roger Corman. Roger Corman. Roger, Roger Corman. Corman. Yeah, I met George Roger Corman. Corman. Said George Corman. No, no. It's like I George guess George Corman Carlin. <laughs> George Carlin meets Robert Corman. I was thinking, I was thinking Dick Miller, and it, just the wrong name came out. Uh, but yeah, they both worked in, um, and the director himself got his start with uh, George Corman. So Spielberg. Roger Corman. With Roger Corman. Yeah. Jesus Christ. George uh, Corman. No, like yeah, Roger. I mean, in this movie, George Foreman. Are you thinking Roger... of the grills? <laughs> This movie, like I said, it's got that B movie Roger Corman kind of charm, right? Where it's kind of like this overtly corny, very like sort of cheesy, but because hey. these gremlins look great. I mean, they look for for the puppets and and Gizmo, everything looks really great, which is more than you could say for most Corman films. And and, and um, yeah, we one one thing we mentioned before the recording started that actually is very much tonally all over the place, especially the original version, and is very interesting and similar in this way. Little Shop of Horrors is like very much like that. That's a movie that, uh, you know, the original version ends with the entire world being destroyed by this fucking plant. Yeah. We're talking about two things. You're talking about the stage play right now, aren't you? The musical. Well, no, I'm talking about both. The original version yeah, the of original the film. Movie. The yeah. film version, the original ending was... The same as the stage play. And then oh. they changed it. Yep. Oh, yeah. In fact, if you look it, it up on Netflix bit, now, you'll see the director's down cut in the with the original ending. You, you blew my mind. Because all I remember from the original ending of Little Shop of Horrors was the guy going, I'm going to get you, Audrey, too. And he had the axe and he starts crawling into its mouth or something to like kill it. And then it just eats him. You can watch the original talking, director's cut the 19, on Netflix the original, now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, about the, his, the Roger Corman. And his Corman. face props up like the rest of them oh, do. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. I am t- I am talking about, yes, the 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 musical version. Okay. Um, right. But, uh, but again, the, I, I'm also talking about things that are descended from Roger Corman, not Roger Corman themselves. Yeah, but that one also is more like, even the film they made is more in style with this. Like, it seems like it was definitely like a zeitgeist of the time. Like, they updated it a little bit because it's, you know... Uh, the musical is very like bloody and grim in parts, but it's also funny and it's a comedy. I mean, it even has, you know, sci-fi horror in it too. It had Rick Moranis from Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. So even though he couldn't really sing, but yeah, 
So yeah, that's a valid. And, I guess and that's Steve another Martin. one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I I I remember. Um, yeah, I mean, it, but even the the sort of the the B movie um, B movie worship that was that. Let's be honest. I think Spielberg had loved these kinds of stupid Corman like movies. I mean, what is Indiana Jones but sort of like another like Errol Flynn sort of jumping through you know you know culturally questionable villains. You know, I like, think mm-hmm. it's it's it is sort of his bag. You know, it's it is this nostalgia worship that spielberg is so good at weaponizing um and 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 improving on you know like because he didn't just make another shitty corman movie he he elevated it and 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 put a budget to it i mean you know i think that the 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 muppets and 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 the little the muppets they're not actually muppets but the puppets of the gremlins they're terrifying like and, and even when they try to get replicated in later movies like Critters and stuff, I never found Critters as scary as I found Gremlins. Oh, the, well, the Gremlin well, Critters also didn't have the budget me. of, yeah. Cr- Critters nope. also had a much smaller budget. Um, that said, there are some yes. scenes in this in which the the animatronics do look a little wonky, mind blowing for the time, but there's there's some like pretty static like hand movements in certain parts. Um, I would be interested mm-hmm. to see what they could do with puppetry now on this because I have a feeling that they'd be able to Me make too. a lot of them way more expressive and you know movement based rather than just being static little dummies sure. you can put places. Oh, even even in the sequel, they're a lot more sleek and a little bit more advanced, and they could do more things. Like even in, and that's only that was I think I was in 1990 or something, so like it wasn't that far removed from this movie. But even then technology had got us so i can't imagine what they could do now i mean like so and that's kind of the that's that's the fun part of it is that 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 sort of craftsmanship of doing it i mean but you could imagine what a nightmare this production would have been because apparently like gizmo never worked and the the whole scene of them throwing darts at gizmo in the sequel sort of a throwback to the crew because they did that with one of the gizmo puppets that wouldn't work because then they just fucking hated it <laughs> they do um, that in this movie too I oh do they okay that that was an homage to the crew because they were very much like every time they'd get ready and then gizmo just you know it, it's you know it's funny um yeah, yeah I, I think that that's great so where does this rank? I mean, Zach, you already kind of said this is one of your favorite Christmas movies. Chris, does, where does this rank for you as far as Christmas movies? I don't know. It'd probably be like, the question is, how do you celebrate Christmas? Like, what movie says Christmas mm. to you? So for me, I don't. Well, let me ask. One. Let's. I don't know. Go ahead. So okay, let's get a let's get an idea first, right? So. Let's say Christmas season comes around as it uh, seems to do each year. Um, how many Christmas films do you think you watch in a given Christmas season? And how many do you re-watch? Like, not necessarily like ones you watch every year, but things you've seen before at some point that you rewatch. Is it just one? Is it zero? Is it like maybe one a year? It's probably, I mean, it, 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 like last year was weird with the pandemic and everything, right? So like we, Sarah and I kind of just binged a bunch of Christmas movies just because we, you know, nobody, family was coming over or anything. Yeah. So that's pretty much what we did. Uh, but I'd say on a normal every given Christmas, it just sort of depends. Like it, it's like we'll, we'll, go th- we'll go through these moods. Like, you know, I'd say like at the beginning, at the end of September is when we're like, all right, it's it's the spooky season. Let's start putting on some horror movies or something. So, uh, you know, usually around, because we already got our decorations up, as you can see and everything. So we're kind of already in the spirit of things. So, and and, and really, it's not really movies with us. We, we normally just put on music. It's, it's the Christmas music that we tend to latch onto. But as far as movies go, I'd say there's probably three. Uh, Christmas Vacation's an easy one because that's an evergreen one that we could put on any time of the year. Um, mm-hmm. And probably the second one is probably Home Alone. Probably I'd, I'd say Home Alone gets a lot more rewatch than we did. I like to watch, well, for me, I like to watch Fiddler on the Roof. My dad and I always watch it every Christmas Eve, so I, I tend to turn that on every Christmas Eve. But that's about it. I'd say about three make it through the main cycle uh, during okay. the season. Gremlins ever, uh, uh, Gremlins ever really gets there because it's so... I, I remember when I was talking to like like my parents and, and my coworkers and stuff about about the podcast that we we're doing a Christmas movie. We we're doing Gremlins. Everybody seems to forget that it's a Christmas movie. Like everyone sort of that's almost secondary to what everybody re- associates Gremlins to. Yeah. Um. You know, I'll actually 
I'll kind of go with that because my memories of watching movies, like I don't really celebrate that many movies now. Like we don't have set things we watch like we do for Halloween. But what, at least in my family, what the Christmas movies usually did was they would uh, fill up that space that you'd kind of exist in if you had sports. So you might have family members that don't really want to interact all that much or you don't really want to talk to them, but you're present. And you really just want to have something you can stare at justifiably not talking to anyone. So certain films would jump out as those safe picks that you could watch and everybody would just watch it. So for me, as strange as it sounds, um, yeah, Groundhog's Day, not about this holiday, nice. but it's a film where you just turn it on. You can start it at any point because it's a repeated loop movie. You don't really need to see it from the start. Grandma doesn't need to understand it from the start. She just needs to understand he's stuck in this day. Grandpa doesn't need to ask any questions that are uncomfortable. It's just this thing happening on screen. It's a little dark. <laughs> it's a little fun. Uh, so yeah, movies like that, I think, are probably closer on the Christmas list for me. I think uh, in the Sound of Music was one of my grandmother's favorites. So that one would get played mm -hmm. too sometimes. Okay. I guess mine's my, my experience is a little different. Yeah, the kind of movie you're talking about again is... Um, I think for Christmas movies, that movie is either Christmas Vacation or Christmas Story. Movies where it's just a series of like three minute scenes that stand alone for the most part. Like there's yeah. a slight overall story. He wants the Red Rocket BB gun or my boss isn't giving me the bonus. But mostly it's like, hey, this is a three minute comedy sketch. If you watch this part and then walk out of the room, you're fine. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do extended family shit. Like my family has rarely done Christmases where it's like extended family people coming in and out of the room, like 20 people. And it's my immediate family. Like that's who's there. So it's not like we need to not converse in that way. Like we don't need a thing to shut down conversation. If we want to watch a movie, it's because we want to watch a movie and we'll pay attention to it because, you know, if we want to talk, we'll play a game. Um, so that's not really the situation for me. There's a few that I watch every year. Recently, It's a Wonderful Life is a movie that I will watch each year. Um, I, I, I am a little bit that guy. I like uh, I like to watch Die Hard each year. I have for the past several years watched Die Hard each year. And it's I think that's that script is like damn near perfect. It's really, really tight. Um, uh, and I think it's a lot of fun. Um and then Gremlins is in my second tier listing. Like this and Home Alone and like there are things like that that are like easy throw-ons that are always pretty fun, light watches. You can have a couple of glasses of mulled wine or what have you uh, or white Russians or something. And it's like, this is a nice, easy, but fun watch. And Gremlins like solidly in that, not every year tier, but like, there's a good chance I'll watch it in a given year. Sure. Why not? Kind of thing. Right. No. And that's, and you know, like I, I'm kind of with you, Zach, my, it was very rare um, for extended family. It was usually just me and my folks. And honestly, I'm a, I'm a child of the Nintendo era. So by Christmas time, we've taken over the TV, you know, mm -hmm. we plug it in Mario. Um, so like it, it, that's more of the, and and my family my 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 family was very big on Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, not not the old one, the the new one, the okay. the one with Attenborough. Um, I almost I almost regret not putting the old one on my list of uh, nominees this year because I saw it for the first time last year, the '40s version. Oh my uh, god! People sometimes say, "What would a conservative Christmas movie look like?" It's the old Ni Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. It fully is. Everybody's motivation is self-interest. It's capitalism. The only reason Santa is Santa is because it's good for capitalism for Santa to be Santa. Nobody gives a fuck about the well-being of this old man. It's just easier for everybody <laughs> and in their self-interest to make him mm -hmm. be Santa. It's good for Macy's. That's right. It's good for the post right. office, the judge. It's good for his reelection. Nobody gives a fuck That's about right. the magic of Christmas or helping others. It's, it's all selfish <laughs> and it's portrayed as noble. That movie's fucking terrible. I hate it. I've ne I've never <laughs> seen that movie. That's hilarious. Yeah, I I I was my I was more raised with that and Burrow Mara Wilson 
version uh, with Elizabeth Perkins. Or I haven't seen that um, since I was a kid, so I can't speak. I I vote did whatever. I haven't seen it since I was a kid either. But is that the very old one? one? No, that's the, the no, one. that's the one that was made oh, in the okay. '90s with uh, Richard Attenborough and Santa. Um, gotcha. Yeah, no, and that's why I think that you know, uh, Gremlins was never associated to me for Christmas. It seemed like a lot of the times that Shane Black will just throw in Christmas just to kind of he does it in all of his movies and that's sort yeah. of what it felt like for this to me it, it added to that that nostalgia gut punch that this movie is sort of going for of like remember when it was fun to watch funny scary monster movies uh well this one's got a sense of humor um and that's sort of the 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 vibe of this movie and the trope of it and even down to the to the theme song i mean the theme song is is so is it's great it's 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 one of the superpowers i think of the 80s um is theme songs you know like and I, I i don't think we've gotten quite that level of iconic jingles since the 80s i mean i can't think of you know most of the time it's like licensed music or or something like that but i mean even like any of the marvel movies they don't ever reach the level of danny elfman's batman theme you know they, they never get that close any of them i mean the avengers theme is the closest one and that's not even close the, and that's if i'm know, being the... very generous the Richard Donner Superman theme, right? Like, is, yeah, yeah. They, 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 well, it seems like Indiana they Jones. serve different I mean, they're... purposes now. Like it seemed like in the yeah. '80s, it was it was like the music was there to sort of be an iconic or, or part of the icon iconography and the audioscape that they're creating for this whole brand that they were doing. Um, but now it just seems like the music is there just to sort of serve as like background filler for a lot of these movies, as far as the Marvel movies go. Yeah. Because it's like, I can't really remember mm -hmm. any of the music individually from any of those movies. Um, right. Like the only time I really notice it is if it's so different from the rest of the series that it jumps out at me. Like the music for um, Rogue One, I remember that one jumping out at me is strange because it was not John Williams. But that was about it. It was hmm. similar sort of music, but I didn't notice it as like anything but just, oh, this isn't Star Wars that I'm seeing right now. It was an odd feeling. We kind of, I think, I think we kind of talked about this during Police Academy. I think Brian actually brought this up that like you kind of miss that of like, because Police Academy even had like a, its own theme, but, 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 you know, even for mm -hmm. a shitty, crappy comedy that that was. And and he brought up a point that like I and I think it's very true that like nowadays it's just like record needle drops right they're just oh yeah. here's the single from this one or here we dug up this old you know Donna Summer tune or whatever um, rather than actually composing you know a little you know trope and I I there sort is, of wish we'd go back to that yeah there's mm -hmm. definitely there is like an Avengers like song there is like a song that they have for like Avengers assemble moments and. If you hear it, you'll recognize it, but it does not stand out the same way. And like, yeah, like in terms of great scores written specifically for Christmas movies, like this, if you want to call it a Christmas thing, but also like that Home Alone score is so sure. really like, I think that's a spectacular little Christmas tune that was written. I mean, alongside, I guess, that Charlie Brown, Ben Scaraldi trio thing. Like, perfect. But yeah, like but yeah, you don't get stuff like that as often anymore. It's very rare to get a theme tune like that's that John Williams sort of. Right. Yeah. I I'm talking like, like professional wrestling, you know, when the music comes up, Oh shit, it's the fucking gremlins. You know, like it's, yeah. it, you just don't, you don't get that moment anymore in movies. Yeah. The yeah. Avengers theme is the closest one. I don't count star Wars. Doesn't count. Cause that was way back then. You're just doing the same goddamn thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, and Home Alone's great too because Home Alone pretty much does what John Williams' superpower is, and that is cribbing from other classical pieces and just sort of twisting them just enough to make them into his own. Um, mm -hmm. I guess there's some stuff from a few Pixar movies that I would say is like close. Like Up has that theme that I think okay. is pretty memorable. Okay, the Michael memorable. Giacano film. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ratatouille okay, okay. has like kind of a memorable theme. Wally -E has that defined dancing sequence, which I think is quite a good song. Sure, it's but that memorable. even that they're cribbing from Hello Dolly a little bit, you know, yeah. they're, they're, yeah. all that kind of license. It's, I thought of like one of the most memorable theme songs in the uh, soundtracks in the Marvel universe is Guardians of the Galaxy. And that's not because of the Guardians of the Galaxy theme song. It's because of the sure, it's other the, 70s. Oh, it's the Quentin Tarantino. I mean, like the Quentin Tarantino yeah. era of like, hey, man, my song yeah. is my soundtrack is just fucking songs that I love. Yeah, I think we might also be talking about slightly different things because, like, 
uh, a hereditary is like a, a, horror, a horror thing. Um, what I'm talking about is more like the. I think what you're also getting at is more the big tentpole movies, like huge releases that would have an I like real noticeable soundtracks that you'd remember, like RoboCop and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, even Terminator yeah. kind of has like it's, yeah. it's not much, dun, but dun, it's dun, it's dun, recognizable. Dun, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. I I just sort of well, feel like we've got we we. We serve our soundtracks to just serve edits or, rather you know, than and, and serving indeed, yeah. to actually like kind of like, yeah, amp up the movie. One of the thing, one of the reasons that I uh, always enjoy when a new James Bond movie comes out as old and in many ways outdated as that series is, is there are trappings of like old Hollywood all over that thing that it just can't get rid of. Like those opening like music videos that it does and like yeah. that kind of shit. And the fact that there's a lot of practical effects and indeed like one of the most famous theme songs ever written for film is like mm -hmm. guaranteed going to be in there. Yeah. You bet. It's just. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and, but, but with Bond, nor should it, it shouldn't shake off what it, it, it should. Yeah, of course it should. That's, that's what yeah, makes right. it what it is. Yeah, Otherwise exactly. it would just be another generic. A John Wick or yeah. some shit, you know, like if, anyway, not not bashing John Wick. I'm just saying, it, but like it, it, it <laughs> because you have things that are immediately associated with the brand. And I think Borf said it right that like with these theme songs, it was all about branding, right? You're like even with Ghostbusters, like they 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 knock that theme back and forth a lot, you know, and it's that's just as iconic, you know. That's why you know, and and I I feel like movies don't want to be iconic anymore. They just want to be successful, and they just want to make money. Um, and it's yeah. a shame. And and this movie harkens back to a more and it harkens back to a more, you know, Spielberg kind of doing different stuff, trying new things. You know, even if it is just sort of popular at the time with the genre mashing, Spielberg's you know at least at the spearhead of it in many respects in the eighties. So you know, props to him. Yeah. I, not that he yeah. needs it. You know, I'm, I'm sure he'll do just fine. Do you guys think uh, we can probably do well, final thoughts? I, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think we. Yeah, I think we've we've we're well past midnight. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess uh, I guess I, I, I kind of started my final thoughts off. It's, I mean, it's it's a good movie, and 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 it's just because of maybe it's just because I saw it when I was young, and I love Gizmo and all that stuff. So it's, but I mean, if I were to show this person this movie to like an alien, I do feel like I would have to explain a lot of things in context to it, just because of this movie is going to take you in a lot of different places and you're just going to have to roll with it. You know, you're just going to have to roll with it. It will get there in the end. And luckily it's not very long. So it will, you know, it, it, it ends right at the right moment. It doesn't Spielberg up the ending where we have to end it five times. And Gizmo goes away, roll credits. Um, and pretty abruptly too, how it ends. So, and, and other than that though, uh, you know, I, for, for a lot of the actors kind of being kind of relatively unknown, and for it being Joe Dante, who's also kind of relatively unknown. I mean, I, I've never seen The Howling, so I don't really, but I, I have seen like The Rocketeer and, and he did Captain America, the first Avenger and stuff like that. So nostalgia sort of humping is sort of his brand. Um, so at least he's good with it. And I, the sequel has its moments, but I feel like this is one of those movies that I wish it didn't have a franchise and this movie just stood on its own laurels rather than it trying to market itself but it's warner brothers what are you gonna do yeah um i kind of feel similar uh basically i thought it was uh it's a fun movie i remember loving it when i was a kid i think the uh, character's a lot of fun um uh the animate the animatronics are really great uh, I will say that it's a little strange as far as tone goes. That's the one thing that's really unusual about this that ages a little strangely. But other than that, you know, it's a fine little romp. Uh, I don't really remember the sequel very much. Uh, this one will probably always stick out in my memory more. Um, I was surprised to hear that the sequel is considered by many their favorite, just because for me, the first one was my favorite. And I remember being a child seeing the sequel come out and uh, being somewhat let down that Hulk Hogan appears in the movie. I think everything else in the movie I was fine with. For some reason, I didn't like wrestling. Anyway, that's uh, that's really all my thoughts on this. Uh, it was fun to watch it again. For some reason. For some reason. <laughs> it, 
<laughs> so, yeah, this is a really unique movie. I, I first saw it when I was pretty young, and it didn't traumatize me like it did some people. Um, I always enjoyed it. Um, I remember even in elementary school, me and my friends, like, singing the theme song at lunch. Uh, I don't know why we did that, but we definitely did. Um, uh, and I don't know. It's It's got a, a, a layer of nostalgia there for sure, but I also think that Gremlins is... A unique movie, even for the 80s, for how interesting and strange and all over the place it is, and still kind of coming together and working. And uh, I don't know. I think it's a bundle of fun. I, I really enjoy. I really enjoy Gremlins. I think it's a. I think it's a. I think it's a classic. Yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't argue with that. And and yeah, so. And, 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 you know, as far as Christmas, fun, unique Christmas movies, because most Christmas movies are pretty much the fucking same, right? They're, they're, they're pretty much follow the same sort of trope. So it is fun that this sort of takes that, that thread and sort of mangles it and, and just kind of, and then by the end of it, it's like, oh, okay, we're just going to settle down and open presents and take his yep. away. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, that was our holiday special, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to be starting getting our nose back to the grindstone, back to the normal movie trap business with uh, Zach's theme of movies from the cities of which we currently or used to reside in. <laughs> Some of us haven't lived in those cities in 10 years or so, yeah. but um, I, 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 I do have an idea. So Zach will be choosing a movie from Chicago. He has already announced it is going to be Steve McQueen's Widows. Uh, I will be doing a movie from New York and Chris will be doing a movie from LA. So tune in next time. It will be the new year. It'll be 2022 when you see us again. Um, So please uh, have a safe and enjoyable holidays and, you know, try not to stuff yourself with too much and and do wash your hands and get that fucking booster Um, (laughs) as often as you can. Uh, because you don't want well, gremlins. You know what I'm saying? You know, mm-hmm. get the booster. Get the booster one time. Don't get the right. booster as often as you can. <laughs> just I, go the once. Unless they let you. I mean, I I tried. I'll take one in each arm, please. Just you know, <laughs> just load me up. I think I'm not sure. Uh, that that's, six months uh, is probably the safe bet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whatever they say, get a new one. Go ahead and and go then. Yeah. Don't go. just go every day and be like, <laughs> right. It's my daily booster shot. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, if they offer it, I I do it. Um, all right. Uh, so Russell is not time. a doctor. <laughs> no, I am not. Please do not take. Uh, I just want to take a moment and talk about ivermectin. I just want to say how great. <laughs> oh, <God. that> is. <laughs> All righty. Oh, uh, before I get to Joe Rogan on us, uh, I will wrap this up. Thank you for joining us on our holiday Christmas uh, special. Enjoy yourselves. And I have been Russell Carlson, and I have been joined by my little gremlins, Chris Borup. See you later, everybody. Don't eat after midnight. <laughs> and I have also been joined by Zach Powers. There just might be a gremlin in your house. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bright light, bright light. Uh, and as we say here in the movie trap, as we started last Christmas, and we'll bring it up again this Christmas, Diane Ladd is too young to be Chevy Chase's mom. A seasonably appropriate movie trap promise. Indeed, indeed. Have a good time. See you guys. Well, that's a story. So if your air conditioner goes on the fritz or your washing machine blows up or your video recorder conks out, before you call the repairman, Turn on all the lights, check all the closets and cupboards, look under all the beds, because you never can tell. There just might be a gremlin in your house.